Today we're going to take a look at the companion for DM Yourself by Scott Scott. So let's get into this. Welcome to Solitary RPG. DM Yourself is a book designed to give you suggestions on how to run Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition published adventures solo. And the companion just takes a deeper dive into those concepts. Um, this companion is not available in print. I, I picked mine up on Drive-Thru RPG. It was only available in a PDF. I even looked on Lulu and couldn't find it. So I'm not quite sure why it's not available by on print. And the only way you'll know by looking at the cover that this is the companion would be if this was printed in color, this would be red instead of blue. And there's a companion on the character that was on the original um, DM yourself. But this is a companion. Uh, my PDF copy from Drive-Thru RPG came as an A5 size. And I printed it out and bound, bound it myself. Um, Bookbinding is another hobby of mine. And this was just a great opportunity for me to bind a book. Um, I like doing that. But you're going to notice going through the book, it's only printed one-sided because I wanted practice at binding thicker books. So this lent itself for that opportunity. But let's get into the book itself. Um, DM yourself, again, is going to open up with why should you dm yourself so it's giving you some insight um just kind of like the original book does but it talks about how this is a companion to dm yourself and uh, just some basic information from there the one thing it does promise um ways to get to the story ways to help you start ways to help you overcome blocks ways to play rpgs other than 5e and ways of getting through the story faster with more immersion, more of an of the epic cinematic set pieces, and less dice rolling. So that is what we're talking about in this book. But the, the main thing is it's just really going to be a deeper dive into a lot of the concepts that were shared in DM Yourself. Uh, more examples, more more to take away from it to add to it. So if you're looking to run published adventures solo... Um, for fifth edition primarily, um, <clears throat> this is just a, these are just tools to help you get through that. So we're going to start a little bit about character creation, um, extra sidekicks, um, extra um, players. So this book really has a great tool or set of suggestions for running your sidekicks and giving them a little bit more personality. When I initially read DM Yourself and talked about sidekicks, it was really just talking about them as pawns that you would sacrifice or just use for benefits to help you with fights and things like this. In this book, it actually dives into a little bit more about giving them some personality, some characteristics, things like that. Uh, so it is, it's got some good content to walk away with. But here on page six, it gives you this chart and some suggestions of things you should probably do based on your your pc so if you're running one pc you should probably give them a sidekick you should level them up so if the adventure level is for like level one to two you should probably be your character should probably be around level three so just be one level above the the published adventure give them a maximum hp give them hero lux like some re-rolls things like that Plot armor, which for me, plot armor is something I really like. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then make some changes to the adventure. And again, everything is gives you some, some suggestions. Um, plot armor, this is a great little concept. And it's really just, if your PC is about to die. And you could use this in any, it doesn't have to be published adventures. This could be just used in any RPGs. And you could actually use this in group uh, settings as well. But basically, if the PCs are about to die, get wiped out. It's really just kind of a fade to black situation. Like, oh, everyone passes out. Fade to black, and then you um, pick up the story. So something happens. You just got to create that story. What happened that saved your PCs from dying? You know, did someone else burst in and help and finish the fight and took them all to safety? And, 
Here under relationships, what this is talking about is creating some kind of relationship between PCs or between the sidekicks. And I kind of like this. Uh, sometimes when we create PCs, we just create extra PCs and we have a group of PCs and they're just going about. Sometimes we'll, in our minds, maybe make a little bit of a relationship between them. But here we got a little chart we can roll on and just adds a little bit more information to it. Um, if you are going to play with this, uh, the one thing here that I highlighted is the the value that you roll under relationships if you're going to use the sidekick ai concepts needs to be tracked because that becomes our loyalty value which is actually another neat little tool um, for the sidekicks uh, so if you have to make a loyalty roll and they fail it they will respond accordingly but i like this i like you know we got a little chart here that we could just do during creation of our character if they get a sidekick. Um, I really, the, the dislike and hatred ones really could be fun with sidekicks because a sidekick could be forced upon the adventurer or they could just be hired on and maybe they don't really like the person they're working for. And this could just really play out uh, with a lot of fun in a uh, solo adventure, especially if the PC's really losing a battle or something like that. Maybe the sidekick just lets it continue to happen because they don't really like the person that much. Just fun stuff. Uh, I just thought it was neat. Here we got non-dungeon default behaviors and binding decisions. So this was one of those things that was I talked about in DM Yourself. And it was just things that you do naturally. Like if I'm in a dungeon and I'm approaching a door, I'm going to check for traps. It's just a, a default behavior a binding decision, things that you do on a regular basis. So you don't, if you forget to do it while playing, you don't feel like you're cheating, that you're going back and changing the story because something negative happened. It's just something you do. It's just to help you get along in the story better. Uh, Cause sometimes playing solo, you may forget to do certain things. And that's what those decisions are about. This is just expanding on it to have you think a little bit broader um, being in towns, out in the wilderness, things like that. So it's just good stuff to broaden that think that process, the thinking process with the adventures. And then here we got extended plot armor tables for different situations and environments. As I talked about plot armor just a little about a second ago, uh, this is just um, these are some ideas in case you can't come up with the uh, plot armor that you you need at the moment you could just roll on a, a simple d8 table and come up with it and you can also give yourself a consequence so yeah someone saved you what? on top of something some you got to repay that debt you know someone saves your life in a fantasy world or any world actually you feel indebted to that person so it could actually be a, a side adventure like hey i saved you from whatever uh, come help me do something else and it could just be a little side quest in the adventure um, something to think about but anyways just some plot plot armor uh, suggestions for you and then here is a article that quite extensive article on how to write um, solo GMless, or no prep play adventures mm, to be honest i felt this was out of place in the book uh, this probably should have been put in the appendix uh, for someone that may be interested in writing um, adventures specifically for this. But it gives great tips on things to think about on how to kind of mirror copy some of the 5e writings that they do the way they write the 5e adventures. So that's where that went. Now we get into the sidekick emulator. So this was my big takeaway from this book was the sidekick emulator. Uh, just talking about giving you some guidelines and some ways to uh, have your sidekicks get a little bit more personality in the game. And starting with default behaviors, you know, like even your sidekick can have default behaviors. I think they would be a little bit better actually with some default behaviors. And here are some examples. So uh, depending on the sidekick class, which 
I think these are probably specific to D&D because a lot of the games I play don't have some of these um, these these types of uh, character classes, but you can always make things fit. But you got some basic side, um, default behaviors that you can pull for, pull from, so I liked it. And then here's like a, a random backstory generator um, that you can use. Um, to help create just a little bit about your sidekick. You don't need to add a lot of information. You're not creating a character out of a sidekick, although a sidekick could evolve into a character. Um, but just to get you started, just some basic stuff to start looking at. Again, based on the game you're playing, some of these races may not fit. Um, you would just have to adjust accordingly and alignment uh, some of this stuff doesn't really matter, but we have enough um, PC, NPC generator tools available to us uh, that this isn't really that important. You can create uh, sidekicks on the on the couple roll of a dice, and you, you can have a sidekick. But this is kind of neat. This was a combat um, triggers. So if your your um, sidekick is low on HP, or if it's a first round of combat, or if they're in melee plus or range plus, some default behaviors based on expert spellcaster or warrior, and that was those are the three major characters which were over here: warrior, spellcaster, and expert. I still don't know what expert actually is. I'm just maybe a hired professional would be considered an expert, um, but it just gives you something that they would do. Um, some way of responding to the combat instead of you just immediately assuming they're going to fight and giving that personality to it. The uh, melee plus and range plus is basically a way of doing measurements in the game so that you can kind of judge how far away things are. So like melee plus, this is the sum of the enemy speed plus the melee range basically. Can the enemy get close enough to carry out a melee attack? this turn so it's just giving you you know what's your your melee range what's the enemy speed are you within uh, melee plus range so that way you can come to the default behavior which if it was an expert move to the nearest melee and it's just giving you a default behavior same thing with ranged and then they kind of dive into interactions with the party so i i don't really play out short rest and long rest i don't i don't go that far into my games i'm more into the adventuring side of things when we're doing the long rest or short rest um or recovering i pretty much fade to black and that's i'm done and then i just do the bookkeeping but this is uh giving you a little bit of a a chart to roll on to kind of just give the sidekick a little bit of personality on something that might happen during a, a rest so uh i like it I, I maybe things like this would be a little bit more uh, if it was more expanded on could be a fun little tool to have on the side um just to mess around with as a role-playing thing as you're maybe traveling through the woods or something like that then we're going to get into loyalty checks. So this is referring back to page eight, which was the relationship section. Um, I said when you roll, the value that you rolled actually becomes the loyalty value of your sidekick. So this is a neat little concept. Um, basically, during gameplay, you're going to track or tally all natural ones and natural 20s in a box on the sidekick character sheet, which is actually in the back of the book um right here and you actually have a loyalty check tally and you're just gonna make a note of a natural one or a natural 20 and you're just gonna keep track of them on the third mark in a in the box you got to make a loyalty check by rolling a d20 and what this does is this talks about the rules of making the loyalty check and if you pass or fail those loyalty checks, what, what could happen? Mostly what you're going to end up doing is a behavior check, and you're going to roll d d20, and you're going to look at your default behaviors for your sidekick, which is going to be the, the things that they do, and you're going to have those listed here. And based on the roll, you may act out the 
the behavior if it's fitting for the situation. Um, further on, it's going to talk about quirks, and this might be some personalities um, for your characters. And they got this quirk table, which is actually a quite a nice quirk table. Um, I was playing around with it, rolling a bunch of dice, and just came up with some pretty unique combinations. Um, but it's a 2d20 chart, so it goes, you know, 1 to 20 here, and then it just kind of continues on till it reaches 20. So you got a 2d20 chart, and you're just going to roll up some quirks, and, and those quirks would be acted on by your, your sidekick. So it's a, it's a neat little tool. Um, you know, your sidekick could just end up running away. Uh, depending on how bad you roll so and it, it kind of goes over it and i like it it's it's just again all of the sidekick stuff is just making your sidekick more than um just more than just a basic tool or a pawn uh to help you with rolls and things it's just adding some personality to them if you if if you're trying to you know, like sometimes when we play role-playing game solo uh, we, it's hard to focus on a lot of different PCs. Like I can't really, I can run multiple PCs, but sometimes they just feel like I just don't have the the energy to put that much effort into running four personalities at the same time. I got enough voices in my head. I don't need more. Uh, so this is just a cool tool to to make the sidekick just have some personality, but you're not necessarily having to or play out another personality in your game and it's just a good concept now here it's talking about uh, pc default behaviors and combat ai's so again more examples of default behaviors for specific uh, pc classes so good suggestion material here for you to run with and then also more of the combat uh, information so how are they going to respond in combat what's the trigger you know, where are they at and things that they might do for all the different classes. And that all comes in real handy here under party default behaviors and other information. So this book ex actually explores into running a party under an AI sy system. And why would anybody want to do that? Um, this book explains it could be really good to sharpen your, your GM skills if you're trying to become a better GM. This is a good tool that you can use to sharpen those skills. Or if you're just trying out a new system and you just really need some random stuff to happen, that's why you may be interested in a, a running the party as an, through an AI system. And this just gives you a lot of information about all of that. And um, just, yeah, there you go. It's just more information on how all that stuff is going to work together. And then here, this is, I actually made a note, um, getting started and overcoming blocks. Um, my note was good stuff, odd placement. Um, I really felt this chapter or this block of text was just in a really weird spot uh, in the book. And I, I felt it probably should have been maybe in the beginning of the book after the introduction into why you should play solo um because it's got some really great information on different things you can do to help you um, with your your role playing and uh, keeping you uh, motivated and one there are some real hurdles with playing solo uh, because you're the gm and the player and all that good stuff wrapped up into one and sometimes it can be a burden uh, or it's just like a, a big time sink and this gives you some suggestions on how to resolve some of those time sinks so that you're prepared you can just jump into your adventure uh, and just different things like that so really liked the chapter and felt felt that it added some good insight into playing solo i just felt where it was placed in the book was odd but that's me uh, enemy combat AI example. So now we're going to kind of get a really deep example into um, uh, running the enemies and how everything works out. So uh, I really like reading the example. It just gave me some good information. And then we get into combat development. This was This is something that anybody can use in any game. And really all you're doing is you're rolling a dice before the combat 
to see if the something the enemies do something other than let's fight. Let's one of the things that I find not exciting about role playing games is combat. Uh, sometimes it's just we're just rolling dice, smashing back and forth. Especially if you got you know your characters, you're trying not to kill them, and uh, the enemies are trying to kill them. And sometimes you're just bashing back and forth. This just adds a little bit something more to the combat. Probably isn't going to happen that often based on the role, unless you choose to use a different system. But basically at the start of each combat round, roll a d20. If you roll equal to or less than the number of enemies in the combat, or the roll is a natural 20, there is a combat development. So as a solo gamer, I'm not going to have a lot of enemies. So my numbers are going to have to be rolling low or I'm going to have to roll that natural 20. But I like what it's offering and it's just offering kind of a little bit of a behavior to the enemy other than let's fight. Uh, so that's all it is. And it's you're going to have to take these results, maybe a little modification because like, one of them is fire from range. Well, what if your enemies don't have any range? Well, okay, they aren't firing from range, but maybe they pick up a rock and throw a rock. You just have to modify that a little bit. But I, I just liked it. Just was a, some good examples. Then we're going to talk about time and space. So the one thing that uh, the author did in this book was actually explain that during the day, you know, we all have day jobs. His day job is a game developer, um, video game or app game developer, and really starts talking about some of the concepts and what he does during his day and, and transporting those or exporting those over into role playing games. And that's what, you know, viewpoint scenes and other film techniques is what he's really talking about. Um, giving you a d20 roll for a viewpoint so personally i think this is really a personal choice on how you imagine scenes or situations as you're playing and it's really hard to roll a dice and then just switch that on in your head or on the on the table that you're playing on might be it's really complicated for me so i because i don't even play video games so a lot of these I, I watch a lot of tv and i understand a lot of these concepts but i don't play a lot of video games so when we start talking first person or point of view uh, i'm not it's that's not something i naturally do but people that are into a lot of this stuff especially if they play a lot of the the video games or even now with streaming on the internet and playing on these um, um, role-playing game servers you know you, you're probably seeing a lot of top view down stuff and you might be able to do some manipulation to create some of these scenes not necessarily my thing but goes into much detail into it i just find it it was fun to read but i still feel it's very personal and it's just a matter, you know, you may just want to take the one you use the most. You might want to experiment with some other ones. Um, but, you know, you do you. I don't know if rolling on a chart is necessarily something um, that will work, but you can try. And then montage. I, I like this montage concept. So published adventures might have long periods of time between things. So you're traveling or you're doing something and it talks here about just picking a few of the key elements and then just playing those key elements out versus the drag of traveling um, playing solo there are certain concepts that don't work out the same and and boring traveling is kind of one of them unless you're really into the hex crawling like uh, forbidden lands and you like doing the the rolling each shift and the things that are going on and tracking all that. This, this montage concept is just picking a few of those things, playing those few things out, getting to the next point of the story. I like it, and this would actually come in handy in any story. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be a published adventure. It's just something you could take away and just simply say, you know, I've got to travel from the town to the the black mountains and it's a three-day journey 
and I may just pick out a few key elements. Maybe there's a little village we're going to go through and there's a, a bridge I got to cross and there's uh, a certain forest I got to go through. And I may just go through those three elements and then I'd be at the thing instead of doing the day to day traveling. I, I like it. It was a really neat concept and it's something I'm probably going to pull away and use myself. And then the last big part of this book talks about story mode. Story mode is very unique. And I made a note to myself, I need to try this. Because as I was reading through all the parts about story mode, uh, it was just getting more and more in-depth. And the, the concepts of story mode were starting to get lost. Um, as I was reading further into it, I was forgetting certain things. Because it's a new thing to me. Um, but really it's just a way of, of, of speeding up mainly combat. Um, and the, the gist of story mode is to streamline it down and just rolling a few dice as possible to resolve a com a combat. And it gives you some great information in here about how that works. But the main thing is, is you actually have another, um, sheet that you would track this is an, a, an example of it the main sheet is in the back of the book right here where you're going to create certain it's where you're going to have like when you take a short rest you're going to get a bonus to so many actions and when you take a long rest you're going to get a bonus to so many actions and when you and you have consumable magic stuff and you got these success and fails. You're going to have binding decisions and locations immersion. So what you're, it's hard to explain. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do a good, good enough job explaining it. But basically, they're going to be at a campsite. Um, they're going to be attacked by stone warriors, three lucky rolls, and then success and failures. So instead of rolling out the combats for each individual character or PC that you're playing and each enemy, you're basically making one roll for everything and you're adding a bonus from basically from what you have available to you. So even though your characters may have more things available to them, this story mode is kind of a zoomed out look at everything and you're just going to have access to a few of those things. It's a very unique concept that I found very interesting. And I, I need to give it a try before I can say if it's, it's something I'm going to do on a regular basis. Um, but it's really a zoomed out version. Um, almost like you're sitting around the campfire telling stories about really cool things that happen during combat. During a combat instead of the back and forth of just hitting swords and nothing happening so if that is something that may be of interest to you you may want to take a look at this um, i found it interesting i just don't know if it's something i will do on a regular basis but it was a way of it, it looks like a fun way of speeding up combat and making it just a little bit more cinematic just like what they talked about at the beginning of the book this was about uh, more immersion, more of an epic cinematic set pieces, and less dice rolling. And that's what this story mode is really all about. Uh, one of the things in the appendix is the example of how to DM yourself. Uh, here's an actual adventure kind of laid out in a 5th edition style called Death Metal. And kind of just walks you through the process of using DM yourself as a tool for the adventure. And it, it was good to read. Um, I enjoyed reading it. And it was some good examples. And then here's a little little chapter on other gaming systems. Um, adapting the game yourself to other gaming systems. This is really depends on the type of gaming system you're using. If it's going to work or not. Um, a lot of the OSR stuff, because the way they write those adventures are so compact and... Um, it, it sometimes can be hard because there's so much information given away so quickly. So, but it gives you some examples, things to look at. And here's the immersion table again, which is one of the things I pulled away from the initial uh, DM yourself. Uh, I liked it. 
and here's just some more uh, on that section itself. And then we get to the very end where again we look at the character sheet for your um, your PC. And here's just uh, mainly with the um, default behaviors and things like that. Then we get into the sidekick sheet. So this would be the top section here would be a sidekick. This down here, this section here is if you are doing the party AI concept because you're going to want to label who your leader is, your tank, your damage, your scout, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but this is all about party. But this is your um, your sidekick themselves. And then we're going to get the uh, story mode sheet, um, which I will check it out one time, and I'll check it out and play it and see if I like it. And then you get some references. So that was a flip through of the companion to DM yourself. And as I said earlier, this book is not available in print that I could find. Um, I purchased mine off of Drive Through RPG. I also looked on Lulu. I couldn't find it in a print format. It may be available, but one of the advantages of being able to know how to bind books is when something's not available in print and you wanted a printed version of it, you can just make it yourself. Um, a good little hobby that uh, RPGers probably should be able to do, uh, in my opinion. But anyways, thank you very much for joining me and have a great day. Bye.